Chapter 27, Dictatorships and the Second World War. He left the road right here. Watch out for snakes. Who ah! said that? Part 4, and the Second World War. We will begin discussing here what actually took place between the years 1939 and 1945. In 1919, the map of Europe looked something like this. Germany had been weakened and made smaller by the Treaty of Versailles, and Italy had remained largely unchanged. This is what Europe looked like on the eve of World War II. Germany had been greatly expanded with its additions of Austria and parts of Czechoslovakia. England and France had drawn the metaphorical line in the sand saying that Poland would be defended. And it's on September 1st, 1939, when Adolf Hitler first utilizes the tactic of the tactic involved utilizing weapons of war that had debuted during World War I. Airplanes had been relegated just to reconnaissance duty at the start of World War I. In World War II, during Blitzkrieg, they would be used to soften enemy defenses. Tanks would then roll in, uh, quickly penetrating defensive lines and overwhelming the opponent before they even had a chance. These tactics worked to perfection against the Polish army, which was overmatched without any aid from the Allies. The Nazis had signed a secreted deal with the Soviet Union prior to the invasion of Poland, where they had split the country in two between them. Nazis. I hate these guys. Britain and France had been unable to help the Polish army, so they uh, brought their forces behind the Maginot Line in France. Germany brought all of its forces to the Western Front behind the Siegfried Line, and both sides basically stood and stared at each other for a couple months. This period is known as the Phony War. Hitler would break the Phony War by striking north, again utilizing the tactic of Using planes, tanks, and trucks, Germany struck in spring of 1940, using these lightning war tactics against Denmark and Norway. Watch out for snakes! Once established in bases there, they began to attack Great Britain from the sky. Um, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, conducted many successful raids early on in the war. Germany then launched an attack, cutting through the Maginot Line, forcing the French and British forces back to the city of Dunkirk. Great Britain was able to rescue those forces, but France fell to the Nazis. The country was split in two. That left Great Britain alone fighting the Nazis. They were led by... We shall not flag or fail. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall defend our isle, whatever the cost may be. We shall never surrender. Then they shall save us. Never have so many. Not so much. To so you. Okay, not that guy, but Winston Churchill. Germany bombed Great Britain for several months, but Hitler and the Nazis were never truly close to being able to invade Britain. Hitler was in charge of practically all of Europe at this point, and that is when him and his generals came up with a plan that called for attacking Russia. And to summarize, in the 30s, Hitler, Czechoslovakia, Poland, France, Second World War, Russian Front, not a good idea. Hitler never played Risk when he was a kid. Because, you know, playing Risk, you could never hold on to Asia. That Asian, Eastern European area, you could never hold it, could you? Hitler indeed did not learn the lessons of Napoleon, or at least the games of Risk, when he decided to invade the Soviet Union. When he made that fateful decision to launch Operation Barbarossa. The Nazis and their allies or countries that they were at least neutral with were in control of the entire continent of Europe with Great Britain still the sole remaining foe. Operation Barbarossa was launched in June of 1941. The Nazis attempted to use the tactics that had worked so well um, in the early stages of the war to quickly capture key points in the Soviet Union. But when winter sets in after the Nazis made huge gains, they will learn this lesson the hard way. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia. 
For you see, Russian winners had a way of stopping. However, at this point in time, Hitler was in charge of most of Europe. Hitler was establishing a new order firmly based on the Nazis' guiding principle of racial imperialism. Occupied people were subject to harsh policies dedicated to the ethnic cleansing and the plundering of resources for the Nazi war effort. Within the new order, the so-called Nordic people, who the Germans believed were related to the Aryan master race, received preferential treatment, but they were subject to Nazi-established puppet governments. Germany divided France into two parts. The German army occupied the north, and the southeast remained nominally independent under the aging Marshal uh, Pétain, who formed the Vichy regime, which adopted many aspects of national socialist ideology. Not for snakes! <laughs> To enrich Germany and support the war effort, occupied nations were forced to pay for the cost of the war and for the occupation itself. In response to these situations, small but determined underground resistant groups fought back, and they presented a real challenge to the Nazi New Order by committing sabotage and passing intelligence about German operations to the Allies. But this was a very small number of Europeans um, who actively resisted the Nazis. One of the sad facts, of course, is that these Nazi victories placed national Jewish populations under German control, which led to the mass murder of European Jews. In other words... Delaware! Hi, I'm in Delaware. In 1941, military death squads known as Special Task Force followed the advancing German armies into Eastern Europe systematically moving from town to town, shooting Jews and other targeted populations. These methods of killing, though, were not fast enough and efficient enough for the German high command. And so in late 1941, Hitler and the Nazi leadership ordered the SS to implement the final solution of the Jewish question, which meant the mass murder of all Jews in Europe. The Germans established an extensive network of concentration camps, industrial complexes, and railroad transportation lines to imprison and murder Jews and other so-called undesirables and to exploit their labor before they died. Some historians believe that widely shared anti-Semitism led ordinary Germans to become Hitler's willing executioners, while others argue that heightened peer pressure, the desire to advance in the ranks, and brutalizing wartime violence turned average Germans into reluctant killers. The condition of Nazi racist propaganda clearly played a role, preparing numer numerous Germans to join the SS ideologues and perpetrate ever greater crimes from mistreatment to arrest to mass murder. Delaware! Hi, I'm in Delaware. Now we'll travel to the Pacific. And that is where we will begin the final lecture of chapter 27.